My next guest may be just the most unlikable MFA featherweight in the entire world. I say that because at the ripe old age of 32, he's already been in almost 50 professional fights. Of course, I'm talking about Derek Minner. Derek, thank you so much for being here, my man. And I was just thinking to myself, no nickname, maybe yours could be like the unlikable Derek Minner because everyone wants <laughs> to fight you, it seems. Oh, yeah. I mean, do they? Well, I mean, 49 fights, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, I think I want to fight. That's, I think that's the difference. <laughs> so I don't think people want to fight me. I think I want to fight, or people do want to fight me too, but I think uh, I, I just like to fight, you know? Well, you have the resume to back that up. You have been doing this for a long time. You're in your athletic prime right now. And knowing that you're in your athletic prime and you're competing at the level in which you are, like when you kind of like look back and, and, and think about where you came from, this kid from the Midwest that's fought in these sprawling metropolises, like um, I wrote down a couple of them, actually. Tarkio, Missouri, North Platte, Nebraska, Nebraska City. Everyone wants, those are like ideal tourist destinations. Everyone wants to go there. <laughs> sprawling metropolis. When you think about like cutting your teeth in places like that, far removed from the bright lights of the UFC, fighting in probably dusty, crappy bars, uh, fairgrounds, whatever the case may be. Did you ever like think the sport was going to like get to what it's become today? Man, I, it's crazy, man, because like, just like you said, my, my first amateur fight was on a racetrack in somewhere in South Dakota in the middle of nowhere, man. And like, it didn't start until like 12, like midnight after the race. So yeah, man, it's, it's crazy to watch the sport grow and, you know, like from all aspects as a fighter, as a coach, just how many people want to train, you know, all that stuff. It's just, it's just really cool to, you know, see like now the kids coming up, you know, like I'm glad like when I'll be done as these 10 year olds are coming up, you know what I mean? Like the 10 year olds that are starting MMA, but yeah, it's, it's wild, man. It's, it's awesome that to watch, watch the sport grow, you know? When you think about just marketing and how a lot of these younger guys out there, you know, they can get on Instagram, they can get on Facebook or whatever, or whatever else, TikTok, whatever the hell people are using, right? And they can use that as a tool to like promote fights. Back in the day when you were doing it, like when you were on MySpace, you were trying to get a girlfriend that way. Like you weren't like <laughs> thinking about selling tickets. You weren't thinking about promotions uh, at least most of us weren't at that point in time how much difficult was it for you to promote fights back in like 2011 2010 compared to like what these kids have now yeah it's different man I just I've been so lucky dude I just like being from a small town in Nebraska man I've just been so lucky to like have the following and the support I've always had so like I've never really had trouble like promoting fights and stuff I've just been really lucky with sponsors with people wanting to come see me fight people people just supporting me and it's, it hasn't stopped since you know 2009 since I started this so like I don't know like that aspect is like like I just I've never had an issue like I know a lot of the guys like coming up with they're like you know they went selling me tickets or like it was hard for them to pro but I've just I've been lucky enough you know coming from the area of like a bunch of guys that came out that were actually really good fighters, you know, and, and it's been, I think it hit Nebraska city and the Midwest before it hit everywhere else. So everybody was already watching it and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, it was difficult. It's not nothing compared to now, but I think that's why, like you see all the guys that have been around for so long, they don't go out there and just, most of us don't go out there and just like, be like, fuck, fuck you all. Like I'll fight anybody, blah, blah. It's just a respect factor. We're just going to fight. Like I'm going to show up and I'm going to fight you, whether you're going to talk shit or not. Like I, you don't have to call me out. You can ask for me and I'm going to accept. It's just a different era, you know? It is um, very, very different. And it, it's kind of interesting to see like the people that I'll, I'll, I'll include you in my age range, although I'm a few years older than you, but like people that are like in their early thirties plus compared to like these guys that are like 22, 23 years old. And it, there's definitely a difference that I see. And it's, it's weird that like we've become the adults and like there's a new generation of kids underneath us. I think the, I think, I don't know about being an adult, but I know that like, <laughs> I just, I'm just able to, I think I'm just able to, uh, I think I'm just able to uh, handle fights better because I've been in so many, you know, I think they, I think like, 
these kids feel like after Connor came out and like, you know, Chell started it, but then Connor came out and then everybody thinks they have to act like that. When, you, when in all reality, there's only a few people, few, few fighters that can get away with that, you know? So I think just like acting like an adult, acting like you're in the adult business is, is one thing, you know? I think the, the, the biggest thing for me anyway, is like, I don't really care what's said prior to a fight. I care about yeah. what your performance is. Like if your performance is there, if you back up your words with action, you you can be mute. I, I don't really care. I want to see yeah. a good fight. I think that's where people probably should focus a little bit more on is like, don't worry so much about hyping up your fight. Worry about putting on like a good show, like worry about winning. And then the rest well, will take care of itself. The, pro- the problem with that is it's, it's the MMA fans is that problem when it comes to that situation is because it's like, oh my gosh, you got this dude that like no one's ever heard of that's breaking the top 10. And then you got this dude that has one fight, but can, you know, talk a bunch of shit and dye his hair, whatever, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and, and, and is really good with words. That's who they want to fight, you know, and that's your just casual MMA fans. Like, you know, your hardcore MMA fans, the people that actually know the sport are, I think, follow it a little different. I definitely do. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm a huge fan of PFL because your trash talk, no, no, it doesn't matter. It's performance based 100%. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You're either going to show up and get uh, and er, and find yourself in a million dollar fight because of your performance or you're not like whatever you say yeah. beforehand it, none of that stuff matters that's why i like it so much one of the things i want to key up on is at 32 years old being in your athletic prime you've been doing this for a very long time and when i look at all of your fights there are only a handful of times that a fight doesn't come through uh that a fight gets canceled it just happened mm-hmm. recently you got hurt. You weren't able to go through with the fight. I didn't really want to ask you too much about the injury other than like, how are you feeling like now? Do you have like a timetable for when you're going to get back out? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I should get cleared this week. Uh, yeah. One of my, one of my newer pros as you've had him on a show, Tanner, he's got a big ass head and you know, he ducked in as I, I blitzed in and we just ran into heads. It's the first time it's ever happened that I've, uh, had to pull out of a fight like three weeks out, you know, uh, the other time that I've had to not fight was, you know, circumstances where, you know, I got sick one time other like on the day before weigh-ins and stuff like that. But like, I've never like pulled out of a fight. So I'm feeling good, man. I just, uh, I'm, I've been real bummed and down, but now it's just time to get back to work, getting cleared, being able to spar, being able to move, being able to grapple again. Um, I haven't for like three and a half weeks. So it's just different. You know, I've been working out light, but yeah, I should get cleared this week and I'm hoping to fight by the end of summer, man. You know, we got a new baby girl here, so I need to I need to go get some money. Well, uh, there I have people in mind. I think Stephen Peterson's a good fight. I think Alex Caceres is a good fight. Um, that would be on my short list. The UFC should hire me. I'd be good at this shit, man. I really <laughs> uh, would. Yeah, Stephen Peterson. I really like that fight. I like the Alex Caceres fight. You know, I like the Chase Super fight. After watching Damon Jackson on Saturday, I'll beat his ass too. Um, yeah, you know. And not just just saying that, just, you know, he ran out the mouth. I called, he pulled out, blah, blah, blah. Man, he didn't call it nothing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I've never done that in my life. Uh, this might sound like a shitty thing to say, but I, I didn't really think it was the most entertaining fight. I like ground fights. I really do. Like, I like watching jiu-jitsu. I like watching grappling. Um, I'm not a noob. I, 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 I dig it. I just, I looked at it. I got really bored. It was Damon with the back mount the entire time. And I felt like it was kind of like a, he had control, yes, but like I didn't really see a lot of volume. I didn't see a lot of work. I was kind of bored and I felt bad for Dan. Like that's a tough fight to take, like to make your UFC C debut on. Yeah. That's a tough guy to make your debut Shit. on. I think he I got think, knocked out. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I would have much preferred to see somebody like you have taken that fight. I think it would have actually been entertaining um and yeah. it would have been scrappy is that like something like maybe on late maybe later on down the line that you could um yeah rebook that one if it makes sense for you yeah man i think i think uh i think yeah it makes sense for both of us i mean obviously you know they look at i just look at stylistically you know now i probably won't get it next but after my next win i i think i really like that fight i think that we're just gonna be I think it's just a fan favorite fight man like the yeah. grappling exchanges will be awesome you know and like uh he's a good fighter, man. I just, I, uh, I just really, you know, after, you know, I just felt like he thought like thinks everybody's scared of him or something like, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, no one will fight me. Everybody pulls out like, man, come on, you know? Yeah. But that fight is going to be, uh, it's going to happen eventually, you know, and it'll be a fun fan favorite fight, man. I think, 
think it has fight night written all over it, you know, with the grappling exchanges. So, yeah, we'll see. How about let me fight Chase Hooper next, and then we'll fight Damon Jackson. I would be very surprised if Chase took a fight against you. <laughs> I would be very, very surprised. Uh, yeah. But, hey, you know what, Chase? Like, if you're willing to take it, man, like, hey, all respect in the world. I got nothing bad to say about him, but – Good luck. Uh, yeah, he'd be in trouble. <laughs> he, I think he would definitely be in trouble. And one of the things that I think gets other young guys in trouble, and I want to hit up on it, I talk to a lot of guys on the regional scene. Like, I've talked to Tanner. I've talked to Ashton Caniglia. I've talked to, like, all these upstarts, guys that are, like, cutting their teeth on the scene. And they're trying to get to one of the big three, obviously. I mean, every – what kid doesn't want to show up in Bellator, PFL, UFC? It's one thing to make it there, but have you thought about what it takes to stay there? Do you ever like take some of these guys to the side and be like, yo, like take your time, work, work your way through it in terms of like staying there? Like the war just starts when you get there. Then you got to fight to uh, keep your place. Yeah, man. Like that's, that's the biggest thing is like, I, you know, if I would have gotten the UFC when I was, I think at one point I was eight and two, nine and two, even when I was like 11 and three, 12 and three, you know, I don't think I was ready. I would have been ready for the UFC at that point. Truthfully. Like, I think, I think all the fights with like the, I feel like the advantage I have is like, for me as an, as a guy that went through the hardest route possible to get the UFC, I've seen, I've been in front of all those lights. So, yeah. It's a bigger stage when you're in the UFC, more people are watching, but it's the same type of production. You know, you get your pictures and you, you know, you got the film on you and watch out. So I like to get, I like to get my fighters, you know, in those promotions a couple of times first, just because like, man, like once you get there, like it's, it'd be a lot if you went through and fought eight bums and got in the UFC, you know what I mean? Right. I just feel like that would be a lot. Not, and that happens, you know, it, it does. It happens far too often. Yeah. It's just weird, man. I see, you know, you see that and then you see guys like Dakota Cochran who beat everybody and their dog all the way up, you know, and that never even gets a shot. So, I mean, it, it's just, it's crazy, man. It, it is. And like, one of the things that it, it's mindful to think about, particularly with the UFC, it's like, with Bellator, we know how they're set up. They have like their red corner, their established red corner. And if you're in the blue corner in Bellator, it's like, dude, the ring you in to lose, like just know yeah. that going ahead of, just know that going into it, like you're gonna have to put on a show. Doesn't mean you can't be successful. It just means you have to like put your, you have to like frame that out or kind of think about that before you are willing yeah. to take that fight or not. Cause you're more than likely being brought in as chum. In the yeah. UFC, it's like you have your established people, but at the at the lower stages of the UFC, like those entry level fights, it's a revolving door. And yeah, it's like cool, you made it. That's great. You won your fight on the contender series, but now they're gonna now you gotta fight Damon Jackson and you're 24 years old. Good luck. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, I think I think you know, I think that's a lot, you know. I mean, obviously, like I fought I fought TJ Laramie coming when he came off the contender series, he had all this hype, all this stuff, but I'm like, man, the kid's good. Yeah. But like, we're, we're about to see, you know, like experience plays a factor, man. And like you jump in there, I mean, give the guy credit. I mean, he fought me and then passed Santini his first two fights, but like, I feel like that's just such a big jump in a high level competition. You had a kid that quit on the school and you're on the stool in your contender series fight, but then you get in the UFC and you got these guys that have worked their ass off to get where, where they're at, you know? And it's just, you know, it's just crazy because the UFC, I mean, you go in, I mean, look at the dude that fought Sean O'Malley and let him be, lose all his brain cells. And then they cut him after, you know, two fights. So you just got to perform, you know, and that's what my biggest thing is, you know, the next fight, you'll see the best me because I know I have to perform my next fight. You know, I, I'm, I feel like I'm fighting a little higher, comp, higher level competition than a normal guy with three or four UFC fights, you know, you are. Uh, I feel like I definitely have done that, but I definitely know like the next one, I mean, we got to go out there and perform. I had, it wasn't that, it was probably about like six or nine months ago, something like that. I had Terrence McKinney on the show and I told him, I was like, I think the best thing that ever happened to your career was losing to Derek because I don't know if you were quite ready after you dropped that fight against him. Like you had to like kind of work on the regional scene for a little bit before they brought yeah. you back. And he was like, yeah, you're right, man. Like I was, I, the talent's there, but I, I you know, maybe I wasn't ready, but it all ended up working out. But I think it's kind of like one of those, I think he's a good example. Like he's a young guy. He's got a lot of talent, but the best thing that ever could have happened to him. And I, and I, I'll say it again, was losing to you. I really believe that. 
Oh yeah, man. Like, man, I, obviously I think uh, he's very talented. He's very athletic and I, I definitely feel like the, you know, the experience factor played a difference in our fight, you know? And I mean, obviously I got pretty slick jujitsu too, but like, I just definitely feel like just positioning in the cage, not getting overwhelmed, all that stuff plays in, plays a, a factor in the cage, especially, especially in the first round, man. That's my, that's my shit. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, but yeah, dude, that, that dude went on a freaking tear after that. And he saw, he got all, like he said, like, like we just talked about where he got in with the LFA where he fought four or five times with them, had to win his spot, but he was in front of those lights constantly. So when he made his UFC debut against for, for Zola or whatever, he had, you know, a performance, but he was already used to it. He'd done this five times in the last six months or whatever he did, you know? Yeah. He's a special talent. Derek, one of the things that I, I want to key up on is you have been in this game for a very long time, but you're sharing your knowledge with other people. I know that you're an active coach and there are a lot of guys um, that you're coaching while you're fighting actively too. I can't imagine like what your day-to-day schedules look looking like. There's somebody always is in camp. You got your own stuff that you're trying to do on the side. You know, you have a wife, you have kids, like, how are you juggling all this stuff, man? Like, how are you like keeping all these balls in the air? Um, Cause that's gotta be like quite a strain on your time. Yeah. I mean, man, it, it just like, for me, it's like, I got my fighters that I coach, but I also have, you know, I, I do this at a premier combat center, which is owned by Ryan Jensen. When I'm away at camp, Ryan takes over with the practices and all that. When I'm that, when I'm home and I'm not in camp, like, I, you know, I have, I take over back over the team, you know, and like, so we, we've got this pretty cool thing going, you know, I got, I got some guys in there, you know, we're, we're looking at like, you know, I got like 20, 25 guys in there all the way from 16 years old to, you know, guys that are getting ready, you know, for the bigger, like Brady, for instance, my little brothers, uh, you know, Tanner, we got, got some guys in there. So yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is, man. I, I, you have to share your knowledge. You know, that's one thing that this, this sport needs more of is like guys that you got to know. And I think that's the old school. I mean, you got to know that you got to hand down the knowledge. And that's what I tell, like, you know, Jordan, for instance, she'll be like, Oh, you got to go practice. You got to go, you got to go whole pass for that dude. Like what's he paying you? And I'm like, well, you know, it, it, it just, it's about that. Like people did it for me. I got to do it for, you know, the guys that want to work hard. I won't do it for guys. Like if you're not showing up and you're not, you're not putting the effort in and practice, even when I'm not there, I'm not going to go out of my way, you know, but if you're, if you work your ass off and you're, you're there and you're, uh, your willingness to learn, that's different, you know? So. In your opinion, what separates being a good coach versus being like kind of a mediocre coach, because you fight actively, you have a wealth of knowledge but just because you've done all that stuff, that doesn't necessarily translate into being a good coach. Like, like I, I feel like one of the best coaches I know, he is in Texas. He fought, I think he had like two pro fights. He lost both of them, um, but he's like a fantastic coach. So yeah. he didn't really have that experience. He fought a lot as an AMI, but his pro career didn't really work out. He left competitive uh, fighting and then he became a coach and he's amazing man, like for me, it's being able to be able to learn also, you know, like for me, like I still, you know, to this day, you know, obviously I'm an active fighter, but I feel like, you know, learning, like going down and being in camp and then like, just, just being a student for six weeks, seven weeks, and then coming back and then being able to, you know, relay the message. Also, you know, I coached little kids since, since I've been in high school for wrestling too. And I think that helps just being able to like, I don't know, you got, gotta have patience I guess Mm -hmm. I think that's huge I mean it just there's some guys that aren't good fighters that are good coach and there's a bunch of guys that aren't are are good fighters that aren't good coaches I don't know I I don't don't really know what it takes some guys guys got it some guys don't you know I feel like I relay the information very well I feel like yeah man and just being around so many different coaches you know it's, it's just hard to tell like I think I've been around so long that I've and I'm able to relay and it helps me for too you know like like being, being a coach, like sometimes just for the last three weeks, all I've done is, you know, do light stuff and coach. Well, I mean, I feel like I got better in that time because I'm relaying all this information that I want to work on with my guys and it helps me break down the, break down the situation. So to answer your question, I don't really know, but uh, some guys got it. Some guys don't. And I feel like I'm only, you know, I'm still like new with the coaching stuff, you know, like, but it's the same way, you know, like, like James, like he's, he's a, technically an active fighter, but he started out 
coaching all the guys that are now in the UFC, but just because they didn't have a coach. So somebody had to take over. And I feel like that's kind of like with me is like the one that like in the room that just took over, that's what happened, you know, and then you have to learn on the go and you're all learning together. And so I think that developed to what I am, what, what I'm doing now, you know, I've had a few of your teammates uh, from glory MMA on the show. TJ Brown has been on uh, Don Shanus, uh, Ryan Leininger has been on, and every single, like, the common denominator is I hear two names. I hear your name a lot. Like, yeah, Derek's awesome. He's done a lot for me. He's helped me out in my career a lot. And then there's James. Everyone says the same thing. Like, he's a very special guy. Um, I don't know. Like, everyone has, like, kind of a different thing. But the end result is, like, he's done a lot for my career. I think he's the best coach in MMA. And your experience having him coach you – and, and working with you through your camps, like, what is that, ex- what is your experience with him been like? Yeah, man, like, uh, so for, for me, like, like guys like Ryan Leininger and Niall Bartling and those guys, they came, I took them with, you know, down there so that, you know, I was like, this is where you need to go. And that's like, that's why, like, those guys started with me and now they're with, you know, they got handed off to, to Glory. Um, yeah, man, James, James is really, like, I called him, I fought Grant Dawson in my USC debut. Um, I didn't really, I was good, got the fight offer with, uh, TJ Laramie. And I was like, so I, I reached out in Vegas, but TJ had been training in Vegas. Right. And so like, I reached out, but they didn't really want me to take it. You know, the guys that I was training with, but I used to go out there, you know, and I stayed with Tim and, uh, Tim Elliott and Gina out there. Well, so I didn't, I was like, well, I'm still taking this fight. I like the matchup, whatever. So I called James like, what's up, man? Like, and so he, uh, yeah, man. He called me back. He's like, yeah, the team's ready. Let's go. Well, come to find out Tim and Gina were down there. So they moved back home. So I was able to, able to stay with them still while, while I'm in camp. Well, James, man, he, he really opened my eyes to like just breaking down situations, fight IQ and, and just, you know, just the, the culture they have down there, man, it's like nothing else. You know, I think that's the biggest thing when I walked in there, you know, it was, it felt weird because I had fought like four, three or four guys that were in there. But then like within a week or two, it was like, you're one of the guys, like your, your, your culture, you, you just listen and do, you know? And that's one thing that us old vets need is just a guy that's like, like, cause we'll go fight. Like I'll go train wherever and I'm still going to fight, but then it opens your eyes. What a good camp is, what, what you're supposed to be doing in camp. And, you know, it took me until pretty much I got down there, like to establish real camps, real, you know, privates with coach. Like I've always put in hard camps, but it's just different, man. Like, and then James is just has a way to relay the information and just make you, you know, he's a general man he makes you listen. And just the culture, like I said, and just, yeah, just everybody, you know, around, around the glory team that he's building up. So even when he's not there, you're getting good work in. I feel like every single time I'm uh, watching MMA, like I see James Krause, whether oh, yeah. it's on uh, FAC or UFC, anywhere on the regional scene, I'm like, oh, there's James Krause. Oh, there's James Krause. Like every single week, there, there's something going on with that guy. And I just wonder how the hell he does it. He must be, yeah, racking, man, I don't, he must be racking up the airline miles. That's all I got to say. I, dude, I have no idea, man. I have no idea how he does it, man. It's, it's wild. Like, yeah, he yeah. teaches he teaches Monday through Wednesday, and he's like has twelve different businesses, runs all these different like what? Yeah, uh, uh, crazy, crazy man. And I don't he don't get much sleep. I don't believe. Yeah, I, I would imagine he probably doesn't. One of the things I also wanted to ask you before I let you go is just kind of like what we see out of if you're in a UFC corner, be prepared to get scrutinized because they're bringing the microphones in, and if especially if it's in the apex. Or if you're on the undercard where there's not a lot of people, the fans are going to hear like every single thing that the coach says. The media is oh, going to hear every single thing the coach says. And then everyone's got an opinion about it. Like, oh, that guy was mean. I didn't like that guy. Or that was good Gordon. cornering. So you have the peanut gallery commenting on all this shit that I, I just I just find it kind of amusing because it's like, look, man, like you're not the one on the stool. Maybe that approach, maybe being a hard ass works for that fighter or maybe them saying like, Hey, it really wasn't that bad, even though it was like really, really bad. Like maybe that's just like them knowing what their fighter is going to respond to. So when you like, 
watch some of these fights and you see some of the uh, interactions that are happening, does it kind of like make you laugh? Like when you read the paper the next day or you go online the next day and you see all these headlines like, oh, so-and-so was mean to their fighter. It was like borderline abuse. Like, do you just kind of yeah. roll eyes at that or you um, just gotta you just gotta know your fighter man like you know like it's not even like you don't the dude like the way i talk to my brothers is way different than i talk to this guy corner or this guy corner or whatever you know and and that's the thing like when it comes down to it like you just gotta know the guy you're cornering and so like the first two you know i had a couple guys uh last last month or yeah they made their amateur debut so you don't you forget, like, you don't really know how to corner these guys. You just think you just got to find your, your, your way, you know? And so, yeah, the people on the sidelines, they don't shit for one. And for two, like my experience with the whole apex situation is everybody hears James telling me not to do something over and over again. And then I do it, you know? And mm-hmm. so then I get criticized. Like, you told him not to go to that guillotine 12 fucking times. Why did you do it? Like, well, you know, like, I don't fucking know. It just happened, you know? Like, yeah. my bad. My fight IQ was really great in that one. It wasn't going good in this one. So, like, everybody has an opinion. Everybody does that, you know? And it's just a good thing. Like, some of the times they don't show the in-between, you know, rounds and stuff. So, you only see, like, half that. Like, not a lot of people really see what goes on in the corner, you know, between the rounds because they go to break and stuff. That's when their shit really gets real most of the time, you know? But. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 borderline shit. Like, depends how you talk to. If you're if the corner comes out and says they're not gonna tell you that their coach was an asshole because they probably know that their coach is an asshole. Sure. You know, what I mean, they know right. what they're getting when they go in. It's not the first time that they've been in the corner. Like the first time I, I think I was fighting. So it wouldn't have been TJ because it was a first round fight. But when I was fighting Charles Rosa, James comes in and like I'm kind of dozing off. You know, like fuck. You know, like God, we got in, in between rounds. He's like, listen, motherfucker motherfucker and like he called me a motherfucker like 12 times and i'm like my attention he got my attention and i'm like and that's what i need because like Mm -hmm. back in the day when anthony smith used to corner me like that's the way he was with me he would like make sure you know and then like that james like and then i got my attention when james kept saying that and it was like okay and now i'm able to listen so like if people would have seen that they'd be like well he's fucking coasting at him like whatever you know somebody would have an opinion but for me that's what i needed you know, to, to get my brain back into motion. So. Yeah. And that, that just answered the question for me because it's like, what would you respond to? It's like, Hey asshole, like you're on your back the entire, uh, the entire round. We lost that one. You need you need to do this, this, and this. Whereas some other guys, you can't say that you can't be like, you fucking prick. You lost that round. You have to be like, yo, like we didn't get, we didn't do so hot in that round. Like we need you to like yeah. do a, B and C. And it just kind of depends on who you're talking to. And that well, I think that's one of the things that the media don't, they don't really like think about that. Well, some guys you need to, some that guys need like pumped up. Like, yeah, see that shit wasn't that bad. Like he got you down. Like, Oh, you know, like who cares? Like he got you in a leg lock. Well, look what happened. You just got out right away, you know, like, and he talks to you like that, whether than some guys need like, dude, what the fuck are you doing taking him down? Like, why, when you're beating his ass on your feet? Like, there's no reason to, you know, there's there's two different types of talking to people. Well, for me, mm-hmm. I grew up in chaos, man. I need all the cussing I can get, you know, especially in there. It keeps my attention, so. I think I would, too. I think I'd, I I think you'd need to call me an asshole for me to, like, listen yeah. to you. Because, you know, like, I'd be like, oh, you know, my vagina hurts. Like, I punched me really hard there. And, uh, you know, I'm sore and I want to go home and play video games. Like, I would need somebody to bring me into yeah. reality. And I just think that's super important. Uh, Derek, I really appreciate your time. You're an absolute legend. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you this afternoon. I hope that we can do it again soon. Before I let you go, I want to give you a chance. If there's any um, sponsors that you'd uh, like to talk about or if there's anything that uh, you would want your people to know, I want to give you the chance to do that before I let you go. You know, all of my all my sports, you know, s- sponsors, supporters, everybody, you know, through the, through the time of not not fighting, you know, like, you know, my, my sponsors didn't get a lot of recognition. You know, I have, I have my main sponsors, uh, you know, my, plat- you know, I call them my platinum sponsors, you know, they're on the front of my shirt, you know, uh, Dylan's auto out of Lincoln, uh, T- twin J out of Fremont, uh, Russ Jones law, Nebraska eight one one KW boring, uh, and, uh, Wendy's out of Percival, Iowa. <laughs> All right, there we go. So that, my main, my main guys. So those are those are the sponsor lists. Derek, appreciate your time. We'll do it again soon.